We are now uh, touching upon one of the hottest topics uh, today in the maker movements. Uh, making is great, making together is really great, but making a business is a real challenge. Because can we really make a business out of making, making it all open? Or do you really have to patent some of your valuable goods, your good ideas, your good uh, solutions? This is really, really uh, challenging and interesting. And uh, to answer or uh, oppose each other to this, uh, this challenge, we have asked uh, Jon Nubi from uh, The Grid to uh, uh, present his uh, ideas about open hardware. And we also have uh, Laila Dahl from the Norwegian Industrial Property Office. Please welcome them. Hey, everyone. So it's the uh, end of a long day, very good day. But I have a couple of slides, a bit too many. I'll be fast, so please uh, bear with me. And Pay attention. So, um, my kind of key points in leading this, or not leading this debate, but my as my side of the debate is that open hardware and patents on the same thing, the same project, they're incompatible. Um, patents, the current system, is not good for small if small inventors, individuals, or small companies. Good for other things. Um, open hardware is an excellent innovation form. What I'm not trying to argue here is that or trying to get us to do or anything is that we should reform the patent system. I think it's pretty broken, but I don't really believe in fixing it. I believe more in building alternative ways to innovate, build stuff, create businesses, and solve problems. So first, uh, who's, who I am, uh, to give you a background. I'm an engineer, software, uh, electronics, en electronics by training, software by experience, maker, hacker, a lot of open source experience. Um, just as a, like a little invention that I did recently is um, solving the problem of how do you connect to your smart devices around and how you have control over them as they become increasingly more common. So you have smart device, NFC tag, standard tablet, you touch it and you get the IDE for programming that device. Um, I of course did not patent this because I don't believe it's right. So what are patents? My simple and Probably not so precise definition because I'm not a lawyer or expert on patents per se, is that it's the right to a time-limited monopoly or exclusive use to a use of a particular invention. And the purpose of this, why we have the system, is to ensure that inventions are available to the public so that they're disclosed, they're not kept as a trade secret, and to encourage innovation. These are the kind of the reasons people say we should have this system. Um, it needs to, to be patentable, it needs to be novel, that means new not something that's been done before, has prior art. Um, it needs to be inventive. It needs to actually kind of have a new, uh, some, you need to have invented some piece of it. But actually, if there's something is patented, you have A and B is patented, and you do something new C, you can patent C, and you can possibly patent the combination as well. Um, and it needs to be useful. So you cannot patent things like, uh, things like impossible, like a, a, a perpetuum mobile, um, now, to the open source hardware. In the definition of open source hardware, which we have, which is a very great document in Freedom Defined OSHV, um, it says, open source hardware is hardware whose defined is publicly available, so anyone can study, modify, distribute, make, and sell uh, design or hardware based on given design, the open design. It doesn't actually mention anywhere um, about patents, or not explicitly. But my point is with the patents and open hardware are incompatible, is that even if the design, the copyright, which the definition is about, uh, allow, gives you these freedoms, if there is a patent and someone holds it, then suddenly you cannot promise these things. You cannot promise that anyone can study, modify, and so on, because the patent holder could just say, eh, you, I have the exclusive right of that. And that could be the per same person producing the uh, open hardware project, um, or it could be other people. So this is the, you cannot, even if it's open hardware by the definition in copyright, you cannot uh, promise these things if there's patents involved on that piece of project. If there's independent pieces, then the, the question is possible. One important thing is that open source does not mean non-commercial. Remember that in the definition, and sell is a piece of the definition. It's important 
um, for the sustainability of the of the of the movement, and it's uh, that commercial use is encouraged and possible because uh, in the end we like to eat and such things have roof over our heads. Uh, there is of course a lot of non-commercial use and uh, non-commercial driven innovations in open source and that is a huge advantage but it doesn't define it completely. So my kind of second point is that patents are broken, the system is rigged. And rigged I mean it's rigged for a particular set of people or it suits some and it doesn't suit others. Now, for me as an inventor, this is my perspective, it's rigged kind of against me because it needs me to, to do a lot of things that I don't want to spend energy on. I just want to make stuff, solve problems, get it out there. And it's not a good way of enabling me to do that. Um, one common thing that people say patents, oh, that's great, that, that means you get money if someone does that thing which you invented, right? No, it means you have the right to sue them and say you can't do that, but it doesn't give you money in the bank automatically. You need the willingness to sue them or at least to kind of take a couple of steps for it to be, have any value at all. If you, if you don't have that willingness, then it's just a piece of paper. Um, using patents is optional. This is one of the, to me one of the most broken parts of patent system today. Is if I have a patent on some invention I made, which is great, but I don't actually produce anything of that invention. I don't actually do something with it. I don't solve it. It's like, but I still have the patent. Someone else wants to do something. I could just go say, hey, yeah, okay, then you give me money. You do something on that, you give me money. Uh, so that's what uh, gives lead to what's called uh, patent trolls, which don't produce anything. They just buy patents and go to people who try to solve problems in this area and say, oh, we got patents on that. Um, there's not enough time to check patents. This is a practical problem, but it means that even if a pro patent is supposed to be novel, inventive, and useful, bad pat or patents which are not these things get through because there's not a lot of time or uh, sometimes skill in missing to evaluate if this is a right, correct patent or not because there's a lot of patents going through the system. Uh, litigation, so like actually doing a lawsuit or uh, legal action over patents is insanely expensive. And it's partly because patents are often vaguely defined and hard to determine if a given, if the, if the patent is valid in general, and if for a given use, if that's infringing use or not. So that's good money for lawyers, and, but it leads to problems for small actors. If you don't have the capital to, to, to spend on a litigation, for instance, if the company that you mean is infringing on your patent, your invention, um, is much larger than you, they can just say, oh, we'll take this all the way. You'll run out of money before we do anyway. And the other way around, the troll, which has a lot of money, built up capital, and goes on small actors. They usually pick those who are not financially capable or skill-wise capable of defending themselves and just go, here, yeah, well, pay up or else. There's no transparency required in patents. So a lot of patent things, because of litigation being so expensive, never goes to court. Um, it's settled behind closed doors. So a lot of uh, companies make deals between themselves about, yeah, like, you have a couple of patents uh, that we think you're infringing on. What should we do about that? If you don't want to go to court, do you? It's a lot of hassle. And so it's settled behind doors. And there's no uh, requirements about at them saying what this is about, what was actually agreed on. So what happens is um, com some companies compete in court instead of in the market. For instance, this is a link um, to a Forbes article um, where it was found that Microsoft earns five times as much on Android devices as on Microsoft Windows phone devices because they have a set of patents which allow them to extract money for each and every device. Oh, Android device, which is not kind of their innovation. Um, so what you get in big companies, you get mutually assured destruction. Everyone just piles up a bunch of patents to make sure that, okay, if someone sues me, I have at least a, or at least a bunch of patents that I can sue him over so that we can just, you know, kind of settle this without too much money having to change hands and the financial risk being pretty low. But this is, again, the problem with small actors, which don't have that huge pool of of kind of counter-sue uh, articles. 
Another problem is the time. It's been a while since the Apple Macintosh went out. The patents that some patents are only just expiring from that time. Today, those inventions are not that useful because the times have changed so much. So how do we do deal with this if we're not going to reform the system? You can use defensive publications instead of so instead of piling up patents yourself um, to make sure that um, you have something. Uh, to defend what you actually invent, you can make a defensive publication specifying what you have done so that it becomes prior art. And Linux Defenders is a project which helps you do that uh, because they submit it to IP.com, which is a database uh, which patent offices searches when, um, when they investigate prior art. You can patent pool in, in pools which um, promise not to use the patents aggressively, so they give you access to defend yourself using a wide range of, uh, of uh, patents if someone comes and, and, and tries to push you down. Um, but they're promised to not use them aggressively, to not be part of the problem. Uh, if you can also choose to get patents because you feel that's the best way to be legally sure that no one will come and, and, and kind of uh, steal your thing or come and claim that you still stole theirs even though you didn't, you can make a patent promise. Twitter did this recently, um, where they basically say, every patent that we get as a company, the employee gets as well, and we, prom and it will trans we will promise to never use it aggressively without the employee's be, uh, 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 permission, at least. Red Hat goes a bit further and say, we will never use pa uh, uh, patents aggressively ever. Um, if you do want to support reform, you think the system is broken enough, Please uh, support one of the organizations that's actively working on this, like the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Also do great work in privacy and uh, copyright, uh, a lot of good issues. So that's how I see the current state of things. What do I think we should do instead? I think open hardware is a great way of going um, because it's, it's one way of doing open innovation. So um, you can use it as prior art. So Although it's not ideal because people don't search my GitHub repository automatically in the patent search uh, database, but it does have a, because your version system, you do have good control. You can prove pretty well that you have done something at a given time. Um, a strategy that I think is very important, instead of trying to extract as much money from what the value you have, focus on um, kind of creating value continuously and do it uh, so much that you are established as a leader. And openness is a very good way to do this because this gives you wide publicity, high visibility, um, and this leads to established leadership. Uh, other huge benefits being open, you can recruit contributors. People have already contributed to your project, and you know that they're excellent employees, you know they're motivated, and you know they're uh, skilled. It's just a huge uh, definition. Another is friction. You can collaborate across companies without any deal because they can just get the code, do what they want with it or the design, and then give it back to you and say, hey, that's some improvement we made. Do you would like to integrate it? Yes? No? It's cool. And important for me as an inventor working in companies, which sometimes uh, do have patents, is that when the company does go bankrupt, like they do all the time, and that's completely fine, in my opinion, uh, if, there's, if there's patents involved, even if I go to start a new company because I think I know how to solve this right, um, then often I cannot continue my work because the patents often get bought up by some other entity or they just become unavailable. Um, I can continue working on that idea or other people, it's like that company failed, folded. We used their stuff, it was good, we need it. Maybe we need to make it ourselves. Openness makes these things possible. So, in summary, these are my points, uh, my position on open hardware and patents. Thank you. All right, uh, I'm Laila, uh, and I'm here because I'm a patent examiner. 
Um, and I'm also here to tell you that, even though he's told you the opposite, I think that uh, IP still matters. Um, uh, as an examiner, <coughs> um, I work in the area of uh, computer implemented inventions. Uh, and I will use the phrase RIP mainly, although I, I see that you're set on the patent debate. Uh, um, but it's very important to see the broader scope, I think, with uh, trademarks and design registrations as well. Um, one key point is that you have to inform yourself. Uh, the basis of registered rights in all these areas are important sources of information that you should use to inform yourself when you're taking making into a business. Whether you like that people have registered rights or not, they will confront you with these rights. So it's important that you inform yourself and use uh, that information. Um, uh, then, um, I hope that we afterwards can have uh, a, a constructive debate about whether to patent or not a patent, which I think that might be you might wonder about. Uh, and I have brought with me um, uh, some numbers from uh, Norway Statistics telling something about how much money Norway puts into research and development. This is the blue line here. And how many patents are coming out of that. And information and I... Uh, CT is here, computers are here, and what we see is that a lot of money go into the research and development, and very few patents come out again. Uh, the positive thing about that is, of course, that uh, our tax money is not used uh, to add to patent blankets or patent thickets. That maybe is positive. On the other side, there is reason to believe that uh, to be concerned about what this says about our country's ability to do research and development in these fields in the future. Um, <clears throat> there's lots to be said about whether to patent or not to patent. Uh, but I think one starting point might be to, say, to, to think about, well, um, can you survive without a patent strategy? And within this field particularly, the question will often be no. Um, registered rights continue to matter in the midst of crowdfunding, in the midst of open innovation, in uh, the midst of open architecture, it continue to matter. Um, um, and um, yeah, <laughs> um, the main thing then I would say is that you must have a strategy that um, is attuned to your um, business model. And um, in that sense, I, in, uh, in my world, there is not, um, it's not possible to say, well, um, uh, is it open innovation uh, or open architectures versus uh, patenting? But it's because it's different things. You have a business model and you need an IP strategy that is attuned to that. Then also you have another choice in that business model, which is architectural choices. Uh, and there is a relationship between IP strategies and architectures, but it's not an either-or position. Um, if you have an open architecture, uh, people see what you do. So, okay, there is a risk that... The risk of somebody seeing that you're infringing on their rights goes up. Um, so it's some very interesting relationships between the choice of IP strategies and, and uh, architectures. And I think uh, they need to be explored uh, more. Yep. Thank you. 
Okay, so now we come to the second part uh, where we try to make a little debate here. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. This is really interesting to hear. I have a few questions to you, but I would like you to ask questions as well. Uh, but I will, s before you ask questions, I'll just ask you, uh, everybody who have been considering to take a patent or have t uh, taken a patent. Hands up. Okay, quite a few. Half of you guys. All right. This is interesting. So, uh, the last discussion we had today was about the 3D printer revolution. And uh, the 3D printer is not new, it's 30 years old. However, uh, it's 30 years old. It means that a lot of patents actually, uh, are, they are now uh, open. And some people say that that was actually very important to import of the 3D printer revolution. Do you have any comments on that? Is that correct yeah, or is it? I, I think so. I mean, how, the, uh, the fundamental uh, patent on uh, fused uh, deposit modeling went out in, in 2008, I believe, or 2007, uh, 15 years from, two to, from 1992. And, well, how many of you had access to a printer before that time? This is, of course, not the only reason why we have seen an explosion from, say, 2010, 2012 onwards to, like, we have now hundreds of companies making 3D printers and making a living off it, and millions of people now have access to these machines. Before this time, they cost hundreds of thousands of, of dollars. And patents is a huge part of it, but the other part of it, which is related, is the open hardware project, which is the RepRap project. So, and I don't think that would have ever reached commercialization stage if there were still patents in that area. So, a uh, question to you, just to follow up this, uh, to both of you. Uh, we know now that there are hundreds of 3D printer companies. And MakerBot, uh, as we all know, they took a step and they decided to, uh, to uh, com uh, fuse with uh, Strata. Uh, Strata yeah. which had that original patent. Yeah, and uh, it uh, induced a lot of debate, of course. But uh, a question to you. In five years, how many of those 200 companies or 400 companies will survive? Will make a bot survive, or will these other companies survive? Who are the winners? What do you think? I don't really, I mean, probably 20 will do good, and three will do very good. Okay, but do you think do we that, need more? Uh, there are some, uh, <laughs> okay, there are some big companies now <laughs> that are starting to produce 3D printers. How is, will that affect the open printer community, so to say? What do you think about that? So uh, I, I think it's, it's going to be good in many ways, even the commercialization phase, even the people do a lot of patent stuff, because they do provide good innovation. But the problem is that once, this is a, it's, a, it's, it's not a new field as you say, but it has gotten a new a kind of revolution. Um, but once those companies become very big again and they accumulate a lot of IP, like Stratasys is strategically doing, it will tend to become the same old, same old, where you have one or a few incumbents, and those 30 companies might even struggle really hard because there's one that takes the whole market, or two. Monopoly or duopoly, it often happens. Hmm. So, uh, Lala, uh, now uh, you can hear what Jon is saying. He's saying that uh, uh, a lot of this uh, maker uh, technology, uh, or, or the, the big patenting uh, industry, is actually uh, uh, not really facilitating in inventiveness. They're kind of, the patents are st stopping innovation somehow. Do you agree with that? Is there, or do you disagree? Mm. Or is it too simple to say something like that? Um, I think many of the battles that we see today that cost a lot of money is really a debate that, um, about who is to pay for innovation. And innovation and research and development in many fields cost money. So there is a system uh, assigned to take care of that. Um, it's, um, <clears throat> it is a difficult um, battle for small companies, as you say. Uh, but it's also perhaps uh, one of the very few chances that you have in certain areas to actually survive. Uh, there are um, some tendencies or some signs that we can see that in certain fields, like for instance in, uh, within social media firms, that IP strategies and patent strategies especially tend to play less role than 
traditionally assumed in value creation. But generally, within my field, uh, computer implemented inventions, patents remain a very important source or very important part of any strategy. Uh, there are numbers of reasons for that. Um, a patent, as you say, is to, you, with a patent, you get the right to exclude from make to sell, etc. Uh, but patents within my field is not used primarily to exclude, especially if you're small and without, with few uh, resources. They are used to gain access uh, to, uh, to, to be able to use the, um, the rights assumed, uh, accumulated by others, and they're used to create partnerships, and they're used as tickets, more or less. So what I'm concerned about is what we will do when we have very few tickets to those uh, env um, environments where research and development are done. That's my concern. At least traditionally. Mm, at least traditionally. Traditionally, huge companies are mm. one of the prime kind of at least recognized innovators. Mm. Huge research departments, like 10,000 people in some companies. And that's where a lot of recognized value come from. But it's, we are starting to see that open, very open, open source, open hardware is actually providing a lot of innovation as well. And it's actually now studies show that, um, study that uh, Adrian Bauer, the grandfather of the RepRap uh, project, the father of RepRap project, uh, said in his talk in Open Hardware Summit, is that a study in, in Britain showed that 60% of kind of the problem solving and, and kind of inventiveness actually happen in home, in the private, home or hobby centered. So there's a kind of a, if we're able to take that and kind of gap towards production, gap towards bridging that into products which get used outside a single person's home or a small club of people, then suddenly we have access over as much as the traditional um, um, uh, R&D capacity or innovation capacity that we have now. Yeah. So, uh, um, could yeah, I say sure. something more? Yes, uh, because I think uh, for small inventors and people who are trying to take making into business, uh, it's very promising that alternative business models arise. So it's very important to look at what openings are created here. But it's also very important to look at, well, okay, what should we then patent? What openings will that make? Um, because the patent system is almost impossible for small actors, but there are avenues that should be explored. And then I think um, maybe I can correct your definition of, a, uh, of um, patents, or because you had new and inventive and useful. And useful is a phrase used in the US, whereas in Europe, uh, it's we're very... Industrial applicability. Yes, and also that you have, you can, pr um, or argue that you, ha that you solve a technical problem. Okay, uh, I'll uh, just have two small follow-up questions, and then yep. you can ask questions. Uh, mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of hands here, that's great. <laughs> okay, Jon, so in your world you have open access, everything is open, it's open hardware, it's open software, it's a perfect world, isn't it? But uh, then, no. it sounds like a good place to be for a maker, right? But then you want to make a business. How do you attract uh, you know, investors to your business, uh, when yeah. you call me a business plan, and you say that everything will be open? Yeah, so we crowd, uh, we launched our product recently, an uh, artificial intelligence-based uh, system for website publishing, and we've uh, gotten two and a half thousand uh, pre-orders, around hundred dollars each, which is some money. But we do also have investors, and we have found strategic investors who are interested in solving this problem. We haven't gone to venture; we've gone to small angels uh, and said, "This is what we want to build. We really think this is needed." And we were able to convince them, and we do. 80% of our stuff open source. This is primarily software, uh, including the stuff I showed here, and we do a lot of stuff like Intel did one of the prime okay. features. That so, we so did. Yeah, crowd uh, funding is obviously easy to get, uh, or not easy, but uh, I mean that's a way to get money for an open hardware, open software yes. uh, company. It, but what about you, the big guys? If you yes. want, we uh, have a perfect uh, company, a perfect product. So a disclaimer, my company does have a couple of patents, not on my stuff, but on some stuff. Uh, and, but like for crowdfunding, what's commonly done, or a good strategy now, is to 
basically crowdfund to prove that there is demand for your product, not so much to raise the money. Because now we've, we've raised a couple hundred uh, thousand dollars, investors see, wow, people really want this. I want in. Doesn't mean, I mean, we need a defensive pattern strategy so no one comes and sues us, but we are the first movers in this area. We are the leaders, and this has a lot of value. We're building that brand through openness, strategically. Okay, and then they come with a million dollars. Yep. And they say, you have to close your hardware or your software. Yeah, I don't want your money. Yep. Uh, can I okay. comment on sure. the financing <laughs> on. thing? Well, yes, because it's connected to, to the, what I tried to say initially about whether you have to find out whether you actually need a patent strategy or not. Uh, and investors is like one of the key things when you start a business. So if crowdfunding will do for you, then, okay, there's one less reason to choose patenting. But whereas you go, if you go into the American market and you want American investors, they are still very concerned about ownership to something, right? So you have to, whether to choose a patent strategy or any other strategy, um, IP strategy, you have to think about that. Um, the other thing that is an opening, but only an opening, and it's very important that you're aware when to patent and not when, to, uh, when not to patent, is that what we see um, in some social media companies that value estimation in those companies are less dependent on patents rights or um, uh, the risk of, of them being uh, sued or they have um, large lawsuits that they might be, um, must pay for. Uh, so some companies can do that, but it's very important that you see the difference if you have a technical solution to something that really should be patented, uh, that you use those opportunities to gain tickets. Uh, it should be used for financing, but also for exit. Okay, then we open for questions. Um, uh, time, I know we are past, uh, you know, we should have been finished by five. I'm sorry about this, but this is so interesting. So stay with us. If you don't want to stay with us here, you can go and have some food in the next room. Okay, please ask uh, short and precise questions and answer short and precisely. Here's the microphone. So there, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> it's a practical approach. Hey everyone, uh, I actually just want to more, more like comment on it. I think I, I like both talks. I feel that there was a little bit of a miscommunication here. I think the first talk was more about patents and I think I just wanted my point of view here uh, to, to kind of throw in. I think there are these two talks are actually talking about different things. I think uh, you're talking, we're talking about circles. I think primarily you have business strategy, you have IP strategy, and then you have a pattern strategy. I think these are circles within each other. I think they're different things. Different I think when it detail. comes to like business strategy, especially like social media or these kind of companies, if an investor asks you, okay, how are you going to defend your business? You're going to say, we're going to have network effect, we're going to have like a connected platform for like a connected Internet of Things product. You're going to say, we have our own internet service, we're going to have like a user paying a monthly fee for, for pro services or pro features and that stuff. And that is a business strategy. And then you have an IP strategy, which actually includes like design, design protection, trademarks, branding, communication, uh, or your social media platforms. That's a, another huge set of things, and pattern is just a small part of it. And you can have a pattern strategy, which is a defensive pattern strategy, or an offensive pattern strategy, or can you write your own patterns, you can acquire patterns. But I think this is a huge topic by itself, and I think picking the pattern and saying, well, it doesn't make any sense, I don't think that actually adds a lot of value to this whole discussion in terms of how you're defending your own business. I think uh, I think uh, what at the same time, just to kind of like go on the other side again, we <laughs> recently filed a patent like a couple of weeks ago because we had to. Uh, and the reason why it was exactly like that, that we are doing something that is kind of a conservative traditional business uh, and on the verge of digital health and uh, life sciences. And we were asked, every person that we talked to were like, okay, so what, what, what patent do you have? What, do you have anything? And um, yeah, and the, the answer is no, no one's gonna talk to you. So. Um, yeah, I think that's that's just how it is, uh, and, and I, I totally agree that you have a business. Like, you, there are more business strategies, uh, open source or building companies where the network effect is strong. But that's a business strategy. You don't have to, you know, follow uh, a, a business strategy where IP or, or the, where, you are, where patent is an important part of your IP strategy. In my opinion, so you can just ignore it and do whatever it, it feels good for you. But I'm, then I would not waste too much time on bashing the patent system because I think that's maybe not good for you and it's better for someone else. That's my opinion. 
Okay, next question. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Thank you. I mean, no I, more I, questions. No, okay. I do agree yeah. that, th as and this is a kind of uh, the main your main thing is that the your patent strategy needs to fit into your IP strategy, and yes, your IP strategy needs to fit in your business strategy, and in some areas these things become simpler or there are other kind of rules, guidelines to follow. And in some kind of established industries, the rules kind of tend toward patents and some like social media, it kind of tends towards uh, open source leadership brand and uh, network effects. And this is, yeah, a very good point. I would try to tie it to open hardware and the uh, incompatibility is the, for me, kind of a key thing or key problem. Okay, we have a question here first okay. in the front row. I just want to uh, pitch in that uh, Ultimaker is uh, uh, a company without investors. Uh, we don't have patents, uh, but we do have about 75 people, which also, I guess, in a way, you could become defensive by being scared that you can be attacked. But uh, I'm interested in seeing and exploring what is possible in terms of, if you look at, for example, Richard Stallman, he uses uh, intellectual property law and, and especially uh, uh, copyright law in an inverted way. So mm -hmm. it's actually applied not to restrict use, but actually to uh, preserve freedoms. Yes. And I was wondering whether the same thing would be possible. And of course, you already mentioned Open Invention Network. And the Open Invention Network seems like a, an approach that could actually work. And I'm interested in exploring whether the same thing would apply to patents, whether you can create a system where it becomes uh, also sort of like a viral model, although viral has a negative yes. connotation uh, for patents, so that it would be valuable for open hardware companies to be part of that um, non-aggressive uh, pool. Yeah, That's like Open Innovation Network is kind of a Linux-centric, software-centric, um, but on the kind of copyright and using it for to gain freedom or to ensure openness, uh, we can do the same with patents, and it, there's a bridge over there. Some copyright licenses, including the Apache verse, version 2, do have, do have a patent grant. So basically, when you get the patent, uh, you get the, the code or the hardware design files, it's in the Apache version 2, that license basically tells you, okay, I also now grant you any patents covering this work so that you, are, that you can actually safely have this freedom. And that's using the kind of patent plus copyright to ensure open uh, playing field. And, you know. yes. and I think that also a very interesting thing that you can, well, if you, if you own the rights, you're also free to set them free. And that's, uh, for many f firms, that's also a strategic move. Yeah, and that's about mm -hmm. the, for mm -hmm. instance, the patent promise where you say, I will never use this aggressively. So one, one remark I want to make is hardware is becoming very much like software in terms of the, the development speed, and so the, the time that it takes for a patent to expire is really problematic. Um, so and this makes brands actually much more valuable, trademarking as a right. part of the strategy. For instance, Arduino and other things like that rely heavily on Raspberry Pi, heavily on trademarking, and that's, I think, is a completely fair. I mean, it's, if you produce something that's open hardware, and it's actually in the definition too, it's very important that you say, this is not that other person's design which I sell. This is my thing. So trademarks, I think, has a huge value in, in open platforms. I agree. Question in the back there. Yep. Uh, you mentioned d defensive publication and uh, getting a patent to give it away, set it free. Uh, the difference between those two, I, I mean, going for a patent is a very expensive way, but does it have advantages to just defensively publicate it really yes. clearly? Yes, like defensive publication is very low cost. You need to write a publication in a certain format, so it says, uh, but that's something you can do in a day to a week, and it doesn't necessarily have to include other people, like experts in the patent field. So that's, I would, if I have something that I I feel I should patent, but I don't really want to make the hassle. I would write a defensive publication. And it's also excellent, excellent stuff for your resume. Yeah, could I comment sure. on that? Sure, comment yes. on that. Um, uh, when I say that you're free to set free when you own some rights, uh, it's, I think it's different from uh, the defensive publishing. Uh, in that, you are f you're free to well, say that you may use this and you may not. Uh, and even though you say, well, you can freely use it, you still own it at an exit. 
So with rights, you can orchestrate your own or the death of your company um, in a different way than you can without yes. rights. Yes, I think that's actually a very good point. Mm -hmm. You can have if you have if you need patents as part of your thing, but you're very concerned about, for instance, the employee's ability to take this onwards if the company folds or whatever. Um, you can use a poison pill uh, strategy, where basically you set up the, uh, the company such that in case of a, for instance, aggressive takeover or bankruptcy, uh, those patents, for instance, then get granted to some very open pool or to everyone. This is a possible uh, strategy as well. It's uh, in the front there. Considering that the uh, rate of technological um, um, progress is increasing each year, should the number of years that a, a patent in the technology sector be reduced from, what is it now, uh, 15? 15 plus. Maybe five years, or what do you think of that? Um, my personal opinion, within certain technical areas, yes, I think that would be a good idea. Uh, but although the span or the limit mostly is 20 years. Uh, the lifetime usually, or average lifetime, is like seven years or something like that. Uh, so uh, within, uh, within areas where you have uh, accumulative uh, invention speeds, uh, patents tend to last uh, shorter, uh, have a shorter lifespan. What is because the lifespan as compared to I, that? Um, I don't have the numbers, but you don't pay for the patents when they do not actually uh, gi um, give you any income anymore. Um. All right, uh, question there. Eric? Oh, yeah, I can ask a question. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I was actually thinking a little bit about, me. I'm more of a hardware guy and I have a problem, I have idea-rea, so it cost me a fortune to, uh, to actually go in and, and protect those ideas, because basically what I want to do uh, would be to be able to actually produce and sell the things that I've come up with, which is what the patents uh, actually hinder today. When something comes up three years after I kind of invented it, but I couldn't afford to push in the 200,000 Swedish or whatever it is for me to make something that's actually worth something it, that's why I wanted I would love something like publicize it secretly here so you can see this is the date that it was there uh, but you know I just want to have the right to be able to produce and sell it yeah prior because I can do that better than anyone else basically so that's yeah but if it needs, it prior art needs to be public I know that's so. the problem <laughs> so that's why we have a, a, a little nice briefcase of tons of weird ideas <laughs> yes I, I won't I, tell I actually stopped know. doing that yeah I know mm -hmm. I just put it all on GitHub yeah, now. Yeah, that's what we started doing. So we're, we're friends that way. Okay, sorry. So there's no <laughs> other strategy then. <laughs> that was my question. I don't Is know. there a strategy to be able to Maybe actually make and sell something? How can you prove that you, this is like, I've saw, you know, there's a famous thing about the MP3 player, I think, where the guy said, I designed this 10, like hundreds yeah, of years. You can look to the clothing business. I mean, they don't use patents. They actually don't use it copyright even. Uh, still, Prada is Prada. And why is it so? Because a designer there, had that company, put their name on it, yeah. and n no one challenges it. So the kind of the designer recognition you can still have. And why don't you just start selling it? Yeah. And then, you know, that's if... That's equally expensive for some products. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. But anyway, yeah. you, you can come and show. If, if anybody's here tomorrow, we're going to talk a little bit about this. Yes. And <laughs> and yes, somebody will be here tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> okay, Jennifer. Hi. Uh, it sounded like you guys deal with trademarks, right? Is that yes. also true? Okay. So I was just wondering how you feel about like trademarking within the maker movement. Because on the one hand, we want to be open and that sort of thing, let people you know use ideas that we've come up with. But on the other hand, like if people copy your name, then other people might think that that's who you are, yes. right? Yes. Trademarking so is linked to kind of representation and misrepresentation. That's why I think trademarking is actually, an op if you're doing an open project, it should be the f first things you think about in terms of strategy, because that's very tied to your brand as well, which is another thing you should be very conscious about early on. That's my opinion. And then what would you do if 
let's say you got a trademark and let's say others <coughs> had tried to Then you need to do the same. You need to have a willingness to threat or sue. This doesn't go away, unfortunately. <laughs> Okay, so we are way over time, uh, but this is very interesting, so we have time for two more questions. <laughs> the man in red there, and uh, you with the um, caps. You'll be the last. Yes. Um, one thing that hasn't been touched so far in the debate, I think, is uh, the fact that uh, we are actually granting monopolies. The public, we the people, are granting monopolies. Yes, time And it's not obvious to me how oh, it's good for the public to grant all of these monopolies. It's obviously good for the companies to get monopolies. I can see that. It's nice to have monopolies. Uh, but uh, in some cases where you have the one-click pattern from Amazon, where if you try to implement it and spread it to the people, it's so obvious what's going on that it's not possible to keep it secret. The public doesn't really gain anything by getting to know how it's done, because it's obvious to anyone watching it how it is done. Uh, and I would really like to hear from the patent examiner uh, what kind of advantage is this to us as a community, as the public, granting monopolies, to actually grant monopolies on things that cannot be hidden if they are used? Um, I think I will use the same argument as previously, that the system is to, uh, to be able to pay for innovation, essentially. Uh, and then the system is misused and it's used for strategic reasons and it's linked to, to business models. Um, and um, There's a problem with sometimes um, the research is done with public money and then the, uh, com the company gets the patent and the public, the, <laughs> uh, the government doesn't get the money, the company does. N no, but... Uh, um, um, I think when we use money for research and development, uh, I think we, we hope that there will be some value creation somewhere in the country. Uh, and then uh, if uh, monopolies is what is needed in order to create value from that, uh, those in investments in research and development, that is the argument, I think. Yeah, but then this, this, you still say if mm -hmm. monopolies are needed. Mm -hmm. You're not claiming we need monopolies to make this. Uh, no, in my area, um, rights are not uh, used primarily for monopoly reasons. They are used for collaboration reasons, I think. But does it make sense for us, the people, to grant monopolies, to actually enforce monopolies with public money, sending <coughs> people to the courts, which actually spend public money to <coughs> enforce this monopoly, when the public doesn't gain anything? and people get the possibility to invent. People are not paid for invention. I invent every day, and I'm not paid by anyone, mostly, to, to do that. Yeah. I do it in my spare time. I pay it myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's not really explaining what is the advantage for us, as uh, the well people granting the monopoly, to give the monopolies to these <coughs> companies and these people that actually write them down and send them to you. Yeah. Uh, at the time when they created the patent system, I think they tried to create a model uh, that will secure innovation, and the patent system was thought out that it should pay for itself. So that when you have patents, when you uh, are granted this monopoly, as you say, you, you have to give up your invention, but you also have to pay annuities for that. And annuities around the world uh, is one of the reasons why small companies seem, or uh, a patent strategy, it is difficult for small companies, but the annuities that you pay, they go into the uh, the patent system, and uh, and. But they're mostly consumed by the same system. Mm? They're mostly consumed by the same system. So it's yeah, been and a that's so industry. it should be a no cost system for the government or for the people, as you yes, say. Yes, no monetary cost, but there's mm. still the uh, social cost or innovation cost, whatever you call it, that no one else can reasonably do anything with those things, even mm -hmm. if those guys are actually not doing yeah. anything with it. But um, th the other aspect, of course, is that um, um, global power, uh, there's always global power, but um, whether it's uh, decided by commercial activities or by inventive uh, um, uh, um, in by inventions, I think, is is interesting or 
it's important to see that. Uh, um, as a small inventor, it could also be your, uh, the only way you can actually um, get communicate and get partnerships gain, with the or because. gain credit for for what you've done. Then I think. Um, People talk about trolls, and they say it's something very negative. Uh, but behind those trolls are very sad stories about inventors who's gone bankrupt because, among other things, because uh, global power or global commercial power is so big, it's very, very difficult to get through. So when they're bankrupt, when they used all their money for uh, in creating, in making, in, in uh, for inventions. Uh, they have no chance, and when they're bankrupt, the only chance they have is to sell the rights that they've obtained on their inventions to, uh, to non-practicing entities that could afford uh, the very uh, expensive uh, litigation processes, which are impossible for, uh, for small uh, yeah, but entrepreneurs. Th those don't, I mean, that might cause money to go back to the inventor, but I mean, to me, the, it's not a human right to get money for whatever you problem you solved, and it's not a right for a, a company doesn't have the kind of the, the right to not go bankrupt. I mean, the, the right to income. Some, most, in my experience, most companies fails because they did stuff wrong, and not because. That, I mean, IP strategy can be one of them, but there are many other things which can go wrong too, and so it's not like saying, oh yeah, but they they still must get money. Like companies are structure that we should at least create to because it's a structure that makes sense for the public good that we want to produce not like that's the way it is for companies and they have somehow human like rights to earn money and live in my opinion okay uh last question sure. yeah it's just a quick one um so i I guess there's there's two different kind of areas that you guys are speaking about. It's interesting to push them together to see where they where they overlap and where they and that's where the friction uh, resides, which is which is cool. Um, but I think maybe to bring it back here specifically for the people who are in this maker movement, in this let's just say 3D printing, because that's the context that we're necessarily focusing on. IP is an interesting one because it's a maturing market. It seems to me. So as the bigger guys who are in there who have a lot of IP and this like consolidation effort that's happening in the market, the smaller guys, the inventors, the ones who don't want to have IP, want to be open and innovate as quickly as possible. It's, uh, we find ourselves, we as like the community who's in here, who's trying to innovate as quickly as we can. We use the stuff that's open to make those innovations, but to step to the next level and to play, unfortunately, the only tickets, the only leverage, the only flagpoles that we can stake down are is, is patenting, is, is IP saying, hey, this is vastly different, and if I want to take a chunk, and if I want to carve out this area and compete with those bigger guys, it's not going to be because we're super friendly and nice, it's because we've got leverage over them. So, so the, question, the question that I'm posing is, in this maturing market, as we start to try to inch in, as the companies, and, and I think type A is a, is a, is a really good uh, example of it because that's right in the position where they've gotten traction, they're in, it's a real company, they're making progress, they're moving, and there's guys like us, PolarWorks, we're brand new, we're a teeny grain of salt, that's just this little teeny starting of an idea. The, the challenges of getting traction in this middle market, that's the interesting place where IP can make or break. And I think the idea of innovation is this allows companies to be able to work back and forth. It actually encourages innovation in the sense that okay, that area is taken, I have to figure out how to innovate to be somewhere else so I don't infringe. Or, now that I've got this cool IP, I can use that to leverage conversation, resources, ways to work together in ways that were not possible before. So, I'm a big proponent of IP when it's used to leverage, to increase and multiply people's efficiency and, and effect in those collaborations. So, I'd like to get a really quick comment on, in this particular market, and this, uh, in software is one thing and on super hardware it's the other, but in this market of like maturing 3D printing, Mm -hmm. area maker thing that I think that's the interesting place to be so if you could okay short comments on that strategy for patents in 3d printing and bringing it to my mass market do you have a <laughs> so I mean I think it's a question on whose term do you want to compete and who on whose terms do you want to be successful um, you can go the rep route and say we'll just sell kits and uh, people can send them themselves. We do great designs and publish them completely in the open, like no patents, no 
I mean, you use copyright, but freely license and so on. And that can be a massive success. Your invention could be adopted by a lot of people, iterated, improved, and so on. So that can be very innovative. That doesn't mean it will bring you a lot of money. So if you're thinking from a company perspective, and we want this company to grow big, it won't be 10 times as big in three years and 10 times as big three years after. Yeah. Then, because the current commercial environment is very rigged towards IP in general, or like copyright and trade secrets and patents, then yes, you you will be able to have extra, you, you will get some tickets by having patents to some investors and some partnerships. But on the other hand, you will get other tickets, like for instance, access to, uh, very clear access to uh, uh, a lot of skills if you go a very open route. And you might be able to have more of a, instead of having one company go to be 100 employees or 1,000 employees or however, maybe there's 10 companies which are 10 uh, uh, men strong, and, or there are 10 companies which are 100 men strong. Like, yes. Thanks. It's, it's worth actually something of monetary value and to investors and to other companies that yeah. gives you ground uh, to step onto. So that's the challenge. In terms of just creating and just innovation with the sake of innovation, super important for, for this market to, to evolve forward. And the reason why it has is because it's been so strong with open source. But as it starts to mature and as we climb up, it's a different landscape. And I think that that area is what monetizes, gets traction with the bigger guys and displaces them, makes room for companies like MakerBot. Yes. Which is, the, the, you know, the, these are the guys who are, are closing doors and saying, okay, we, we started with an open source and now we're closed yeah. so that we can push The problem is that there's always, I mean, there's, in general, there are good intentions. I'll okay. give you the last I'm, word. I'm sorry, but we have to finish okay, now. Okay, I'll, I'll give two pointers. Okay. And they're not really links, but okay. My presentation will be on GitHub. In there, I have a couple of links to the open source hardware associations uh, kind of uh, brainstorming uh, around uh, open hardware marketing and uh, uh, strategies for businesses, and a blog post which is very detailed. So that's something that some people might want to look at. So the final question to you: Will you share your PowerPoint? Open <laughs> access. Okay. I don't think Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. It's very difficult. Thank you very much. What a great day. Uh,